as you can see in my uh, slide, start with the word vision. It means that you believe, you know, you cannot believe everything I say 100%. Vision means that this is not tested stuff. So, so uh, typically what I work on is, is, is profitability analysis of industrial investments. I work with uh, business development uh, using uh, information systems, how analytics can change the way we do business and, and, and things like that. My background is in finance and in information systems. But today I'm going to put myself on the limb and I'm going to throw out some ideas that I think will perhaps uh, uh, take place in the future. So therefore the uh, title of the talk has the word vision. What I'm going to talk about is uh, something that I think may, may uh, happen on a global scale. And uh, I predict that there will be an eco ecosystem around predictive maintenance, or say advanced maintenance, and uh, additive manufacturing. And as I already told you, uh, the, these ideas, these things, they hail from Manufacturing 4.0, our, our, our research project that is basically tasked to think about these things. Uh, I believe that in this audience there are many who know much more than I know about some specific topics with regards to my presentation. So after the presentation, please correct me and tell me that right now you are, are not talking about something that we think is, 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 is uh, correct. And, and, and therefore, or please uh, correct me, this is uh, why I'm so excited to be here. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm firstly going to talk very shortly about addi additive manufacturing. Uh, pretty much everyone here knows what additive manufacturing is. It is 3D printing. But how that ties together with predictive maintenance is what I find interesting. I'm going to talk about the relationship of these two concepts. Then I'm going to talk about how uh, the designs that are used in additive manufacturing uh, will most likely be uh, wrapped up into uh, platforms. You will then hopefully understand exactly what I'm talking about as we, we, we go further. And what type of strategic issues, problems that will create in the industry of additive manufacturing and also in the maintenance industry. And I will talk about things as, as, as uh, the importance of, of trusted networks in maintenance and in, in additive manufacturing, and, and maybe also how cryptography will uh, play a, a big role in these things in the future, and then I will draw some conclusions. So, additive manufacturing. As I said, additive manufacturing typically goes under the name 3D printing, but uh, it's uh, actually are all the techniques that are based on creating shapes by adding material rather than removing material. And uh, typically what that means is when we only add the material that we need uh, is that there is a lot less material wasted. So potentially 3D printing or additive manufacturing is a way to reduce the use of materials. And as we know, materials, metals, etc., etc., are uh, a, a they are a raw material that can be very, very costly, especially materials that are highly durable or highly flexible are combinations of highly durable and highly flexible uh, materials uh, are very costly. Unless we use them, the better it is because our costs are going down. And additive manufacturing is one of the key components in what we typically refer to as manufacturing 4.0 and other components will include interoperability uh, of systems. That means that there's automatic data interchange between machines without a human component. Uh, automation in manufacturing, uh, that would typically mean the use of a lot of robots and uh, basically taking the human out of the equation sometimes. Many times we hear other visions that uh, uh, tell us that, that we will have a completely human free manufacturing environments, but as we just heard, uh, we're only on our way there. So what I'm talking about is probably not going to happen in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10, 15 years or something like that.
like that, and maybe only partially. Time will tell. But anyway, what, what I'm basing this, this presentation on is the notion that 3D printers or additive manufacturing devices will be able to print almost anything they are given a recipe to print. Now, where does that recipe come from and what is that recipe? Well, the recipe is nothing more than the digital blueprint of that printable object. But also including information on if the system is fully automated, how the rob robot helpers have to act when this additive manufacturing is being done. So it is not only the blueprint, but it is also the instructions for different types, different setups of machinery that are connected to the printer. And of course, we are not there yet. Research is ongoing among other things on, 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 on the listed issues here. The, the printers themselves are a topic of, of, of a lot of research. How precise these printers can be, what types of different printing methods are used, what, what type of complex machinery uh, uh, is, is connected. I, I mean, I, I know that in the future we will have machines that are partially helped by a robot, but we don't have them yet, really. I mean, we might have in some research environment, but we don't really have them uh, in use anywhere. Uh, advancement of robotics and automation involved is, is a key issue here as well. Uh, then materials research. E everyone who is involved in materials research knows that up the road has hardly been uh, totally covered. I mean, we are even now finding new me metals with new or new characteristics for metals such as the magnetic uh, memory metals and the, the electric memory metals where different kinds of of, of very, very smart things can be done by using things as magnetism. And this means that in the future we will be able to print not only components, but we will be able to print functioning machines. And this is extremely interesting from the point of view of maintenance because spare parts typically might be modules. And what if we could build those modules as ready parts? to enter into, say, the devices that we are maintaining. Cost reduction and, and durability of printed goods is, of course, a very big issue because if the printed product is not as good as the, say, for example, cast metal product, then it is at a disadvantage. It must be of the same quality as the, the alternatives to be uh, highly competitive. So the methods and tools used, say for example, when we have not so precise printing, what do you do to make that part still totally usable and so forth? How do you finish uh, uh, the added manufacturing goods and so forth? Material-based issues have uh, a lot to do with the cost because what if we can come up with new materials, combinations of materials that are printable and might be less expensive than traditional way of, of, of printing parts. Volume of printers is increasing at a very, very fast pace. That will bring down the actual uh, prices of anything that is put up. The work is not being done yet, so we have many, many different standards. There are no clear winners. So all of these things that we find working quite well, say, for example, uh, many types of software, many types of, well, mobile phones and all that, we don't have that yet for, for, for uh, additive manufacturing devices. The bottom line is that the abilities of additive manufacturing are going up all of the time, and the costs of additive manufacturing are and will go down dramatically in the future. So predictive maintenance. Well, we pretty much heard a lot about predictive maintenance just now. So I'm not going to go into detail into predictive maintenance, but how I see predictive maintenance is uh, broadly, the practice of scheduling and performing maintenance in a way that pre 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 precedes failures and, and minimizes the unexpected failure. This includes, of course, uh, the predictive ability that we need to have in order to uh, replace uh, and maintain things in time before unexpected failures happen. It also includes the optimization of, of maintenance schedules. And this is, of course, a, a, a very difficult problem sometimes. And, and, and it's, we, we need to make decisions with regards to the, the expectations we have on such uh, uh, optimizations. For example, 
what type of policy we adopt or what type of failure, level, failure levels we uh, are ready to accept. In any case, what we have are highly complex problems from the mathematical point of view that we even today struggle to solve uh, due to issues with computing power and so forth. So the solutions need to be very smart. So questions like what else do we do when we optimize a maintenance schedule, for example, while the hood is open, what if we find out that a part is, is, is going bad, what else do we change what, when, when, we, when we start the maintenance? What do we do together? How can we group different, different maintenance procedures at the same time and so forth and so forth? These types of problems will just increase the complexity. So we are not there yet either in terms of, 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 of being able to solve the most difficult problems. Systems can be very learning, as we just heard, and, and when the parameters change, we need to use different, say, in Beka system, they were using different types of, of benchmarks for different situations. So obviously, the, the, the more we go on, the more benchmarks we have, the better we become. So learning is one issue there as well. But typically, the typical target of these optimizations and, and the work we do on predictive maintenance, they are single systems. Somebody raised the question, of what if we have a library that would be applicable to a number of systems simultaneously? Could we then maybe go about and optimize a multiple system, uh, super system? Oh, sure. But we're not there yet. Problem complexity will increase uh, and, and, and so forth. But these are the things that the providers of maintenance services are really interested in. Because when, when, we, when we are looking at multiple system optimizations, uh, we, we, we start looking at how can we then also optimize our use of our workforce, how can we optimize the, the, the parts that we are using and so forth and so forth, the picture becomes more complete. And these are the types of problems that we will need to look at more uh, generally also from the point of academic research. Well, the goals we typically have are to minimize downtime, maximize component lifetimes, minimizing maintenance costs. We all know that. That's good. Benefits include, apart from the cost reductions, things like uh, our ability to optimize our maintenance resources better. Okay, of course, when we are working for a client, the client wants the things above, the minimizing, the maximizing, and the minimizing things. But from a point of view of a company that is doing the maintenance, we may want to optimize the use of our staff, which is also a limiting typically highly limiting resource. Uh, we want to uh, minimize our inventories of spare parts. Spare parts, they cost a lot of money. We don't want to have too many spare parts in our inventory because otherwise we will have millions uh, just in the inventory not making money for us because they're just there. And uh, what about the, the types of promises that we are making to our clients uh, can, how high can we gear it? How tough the promises that we make are depends on our ability to deliver. The company typically that can, uh, can give the, the, the biggest promises at the lowest price will win the competition. And if these promises are not founded on real abilities, that means that at some point somebody's going to lose. So these types of benefits that predictive maintenance brings, they will accrue to both the owner of the system that is being maintained and the provider of these maintenance services. So it must be win-win at all times. And ability to do maintenance better is a source of lasting competitive advantage. We all know that. Now, what if we look at, and I've written there one way, how these two issues are connected? The relationship between maintenance and manufacturing. Well, one, this is just one uh, uh, point of view. One co co connecting issue between maintenance and manufacturing is the manufacturing of spare parts. The maintenance companies need the spare parts and the manufacturing companies typically provide. Say, for example, that we have an auto manufacturer, well, they, they will they will build the auto automobile and sell it anywhere in the world. And later on, they will have to provide them with supplies of spare parts. 
Typically, if you are if you are selling a brand new automobile, you are the only one who actually have the, has those parts. It will take a year or a couple of years because before the OEM manufacturers will come up with, with uh, cheaper parts. So for some time, you have a locking on those on those spare parts. And the manufacturing businesses are therefore uh, they're they're clients of the maintenance businesses. Obviously, sometimes the manufacturing business is the main. It's the same business, but for the uh, purpose of this this uh, presentation, I'm considering these as if they were two different firms. But of course, we can understand it as a one big firm. And what happens is that the manufacturing business designs the spare parts, makes the spare parts, packs the spare parts, stores the spare parts, sells the spare parts, and logistics business, which is the business that sometimes com uh, connects these two businesses, ships the spare parts stores the spare parts, uh, and, and then the maintenance business installs and so forth and so forth. You understand, this is very simple. But what if we enter ma additive manufacturing here? What, ha what will happen to this picture? What will happen is that when, when the 3D printers start printing the needed parts on location, the importance of logistics will go down dramatically. This means that there are less parts to be shipped and, and uh, less parts to be stored. So the costs of inventory will go down dramatically also for the manufacturer, logis the, the logistics business, which are typically uh, doing the, the inventory. Uh, the, 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 it's actually uh, logistics companies that own the, the or, or house the inventories of their clients typically. That business will disappear. Also, the maintenance business will no longer have a problem in, 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 in keeping inventory of spare parts. Because when we have the ability to print on site, we don't need an inventory. We just print what we need on demand. And who's going to print? That's a good question. Is it the maintenance company? Or is it going to be the logistics company that will print? Or is it going to be some kind of a trusted network of owners of additive manufacturing uh, uh, machinery? Some new types of companies that will take over this business. Or will the manufacturing businesses actually start operating a network of their own additive manufacturing additive manufacturing centers all around the world. These are interesting questions. Now, okay, we understand that when something breaks, we can print it, but obviously the good idea is to know in advance when something breaks, so we might print in advance. So when we now combine, let's say, the, the abilities to predictively maintain and to uh, print spare parts by using technologies of additive manufacturing, we come at us in a situation where everything can be done on site, pretty much. We don't need to ship stuff from anywhere. The lead time that we get from the machine sniffing that there will be a fault in this and this part of the machinery, and hopefully we can in the future identify part by part what we need to replace, we can start the printing on site just in time. That's a uh, theory. <laughs> but in practice, of course, uh, we are going to get close to that. But you understand the point. The whole logistics business will disappear at some point of time. And if you now look at the sheer number of ships shipping stuff from place A to place B, that's going to be quite an interesting change in how the world works, when almost everything in the future can be uh, manufactured in the uh, additive manufacturing way. So the logistics business will disappear, partly at least. So this is interesting. <coughs> so we can expect that manufacturing of spare parts will increase if we go towards additive manufacturing. And this means that logistics will not be very important anymore. And logistics costs are very high.
high in terms of the total cost of, of, of maintenance of some, some, some types of, of, of maintenance. Maintenance itself accounts for up to 15 to 60 percent of the costs of, of running, uh, uh, say for example, uh, some types of, of, of plants. The predictive systems will be able to order everything automatically. They will be able to pack the things that they are printing. Maybe they will be delivered by robots. Maybe the maintenance and changing the port parts will also be autonomous. There are already some test plants in Switzerland that I have heard of where uh, uh, maintenance is done 100% by robots automatically. It's quite interesting. Maybe that will be the future also elsewhere. So all this means is that large maintained facilities will most likely also have integrated uh, additive manufacturing units. So maintenance business will change. And of course, predictive maintenance is part of it, but there will also be other parts. So where do the designs come from? Remember, they are digital. These machines, they need digital information about what they are supposed to print. So what if there was an app store of addi additive manufacturing designs? What would that look like? Okay, it's enough to go to Google and, and write on Google additive uh, or, or 3D designs. And you get at least 15 sites that offer you hundreds and hundreds of designs for free. If you're a hobbyist, you can download them. And if you, if you have the right machine that fits with the design that the machine can print. But you don't find today additive manufacturing libraries for business to business stuff. Why? Well, because these designs are, of course, a key issue in the portfolio of, of parts manufacturers. You cannot give them out for free. And if you give them out, you have to have a way to ensure that there will not be huge piratism of these designs. Because your business will disappear. That's interesting. So how would an app store for these designs actually look like? And who is able to use it? And what are the cryptographic technologies, for example, that are needed in order for that business to be so reliable that companies that do these designs are actually ready to put their stuff there. I know that there's a French company called Dassault Systems that is actually trying to build this. I don't know if they're, they have had any success with it, but, but uh, I know that they are, they are doing it. And what's interesting is that just like the app stores that we have around for our mobile phones, if we have such an app store, then the owner of that app store will actually have huge control over the, the, these uh, designs. And most likely will be able to extract a fee from the companies that are putting their stuff over there. What these types of stores will do to the business of manufacturing, I bet nobody knows. Could I, as a third party individual, go there and buy licenses to print designs and print them and put them in my inventory and promise maybe even faster delivery? Could I do that? Well, I mean, say for example, a, an, an elevator manufacturer would probably have absolutely nothing against it if I paid them the full price. Or would I be allowed to do that only if I was in their trusted network and I could guarantee that the quality of the stuff that I do with their design would actually be exactly as good as if they did it themselves and so forth. There are many, many questions that need to be answered. But we, I bet we will need to be answering these questions. How would that store be accessed automatically by the robots, the, the machinery itself? The maintenance robot tells it, okay, we need this part. The 3D printer will automatically get the, the design from the store and start printing. This is interesting. Everything is digitalized. What is all of this going to cost? How do we price these designs? 
I mean, we know how to price the, the, the ready part because we know how much it costs from the beginning to the end. But what about the design only? How, what is the cost? We will start, uh, we will need to start understanding how to really price designs better. It is not uh, uh, clear at this time. How do you price the design, just the design very well? And, and it's, it's going to be a big competition on the price of designs, competing designs. Trust, it will be very important. Who are you going to give your design to? And you must trust them not to become a pirate or give it to uh, 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 a, a third party that might start producing it. We will have to figure out if these machines can be operated in a way that they, uh, they truly can only print, for example, one copy or the number of copies of something that we agreed and not more. Copyright issues become extremely important in maintenance business all of a sudden. Stuff that you never had to deal with will come around. And this is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm thinking that if these things happen, there's going to be a lot of turmoil in the market. So what's going to happen? Will the logistic companies that are extremely powerful, will they start running the additive manufacturing business? They already are located all over the world. They have the network. Or will maintenance companies adopt the adaptive manufacturing business of the spare parts that they typically use? Sounds good. Why not both of them? Or will there be a network of smaller companies specializing in additive manufacturing of different types? Somebody specializing in very hard metals, somebody else is, is, is specializing in some other types of materials, for example, or around an industry. Or will the manufacturing companies be try, will they try to hold on to full control of, of the additive manufacturing for their parts also. Some of them will, but will that be a winning strategy? We don't know. And what's the role of the OEM manufacturers after this change? Will they go out of business? That's very interesting. So there are many, many, let's say, future scenarios that are totally possible. Which one will win? We don't know. My job to try to so, a little bit to take away. Additive manufacturing is a, also a logistics revolution. And predicted maintenance and additive manufacturing together form a basis of, few, of, of further extensions to the service-based business models in maintenance. At least I believe so. And commoditizing additive manufacturing designs, it's going to be a huge future platform economy. And who will have the platform will probably make the most money. Who's going to be the <laughs> of additive manufacturing business to business? We don't know. <laughs> and probably we could come up with a clear agenda for relevant research around predictive maintenance bundled with additive manufacturing that would help universities and other researchers focus on the right we need a lot of research to go that way, but uh, I believe that we are going in the, in, in the way that I envision in this vision. So thanks for your attention. Okay, as Lisa said, now it's time to say the table you're wrong. No, maybe we'll do that later. Time for one or two quick questions and comments. Nobody has questions. Well, oh, maybe it's a bit long, but uh, I'll try to make it short. What I think is that uh, this vision is missing the economy of specialization. So if I'm able to produce the spare parts by myself, why don't I even design that? Well, because the one that is designing has specialized in doing that, probably also manufacturing it. So 
So that's why I think uh, that uh, this kind of vision is, is a bit tricky in this point. Uh, in Very this tricky. But let me ask you a question. You buy a car, uh, $80,000 automobile, and uh, something breaks. And I tell you that, okay, if you print it, that part yourself, the guarantee's over. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to take my part that, and you just pay, you don't have to do anything? What are you going to do? Well, it depends on how, cost, how is the cost for printing inside. And but you also have to design it. Yeah, okay. That's what so that's why for business to consumer, not going to happen. But for business to business might be different. And de depending on what is the actual cost of the part, there will be some kind of a threshold. Oh, if the part is costing over that threshold, typically I have put so much extra price on that part that you start thinking about it, right? So you are right. This will drive the cost down so that I cannot take that extra profit my profit will be maximized by your level of discomfort in starting to, to re-engineer that stuff for yourself. You are absolutely right. And, but I don't want to give you, if I'm printing machines, it, you will not be able to understand what's inside the black box unless you destroy that part. You understand what I'm saying? So you, if, if you have one, uh, one piece only, then you can 3D, uh, take a 3D camera and look at how, what it looks like and you can, you can immediately pre build a model of it. But if there's something inside that you don't know about, you will have to put it to millions of pieces to be able to, to print exactly the same. And these Plus are kinds of issues that, that we, are, we are looking at when we are Plus the assembly, so that would be tricky as well. So mm -hmm. if I'm able to, to produce the part of myself, operator that is going to actually assemble it because I as a manufacturing manufacturer may say that I only accept repairs by this company and if you use my parts so but these are all things that are happening right now only after five years for the old cars you can get this OEM and everybody can do the maintenance what if it's some critical that if something goes wrong and somebody dies, are you going to actually risk it or just pay? Because you can roll the, the cost anyway to the consumer. Okay, one more short question. You want to speak? Uh, okay, so what's your best uh, guess or what's your estimate for the timing of this revolution? This when is the question that I was afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe for some easy parts uh, with high durability, we are going to be there in 10 years. Me? We are, we are there already, probably, for a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, the things that I hear, uh, I don't know, for some, some, some parts, maybe 10 years, 15 years. But I mean, this is, this is really going to be the logistics downfall. And that's why I think it's going to be the logistics companies that are going to take over this. Because they understand that if this happens, business is dead. Okay, we can continue the discussion uh, during the coffee break. <laughs>